What does it mean to say that you know God? What does it mean to say that you know God? Does it mean doing your daily devotionals? Attending your weekly Bible study? Does it mean reading books about theology and religion? Knowing about Hebrew and Greek? Maybe it means coming to church once a week? In our passage today, we see Jesus, and actually I invite you to have your Bibles open on today's passage, if you'd like, because I'll be referring to it quite a lot. So have, have the passage open, and um, it'll help you follow along. And in this passage, we see Jesus praying to his Father in this intensely intimate way. And so he says, no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. So you can see that Jesus and his Father enjoy this very unique relationship. And so, over the centuries, the church worked very hard to understand what it meant exactly to say that Jesus was the Son of the Father. Did it mean he was God's Son in the same way that King David was? Or may maybe Jesus was more like an angel? Or maybe Jesus was just another great prophet or priest or teacher? One popular view in the first and second centuries was modalism. And modalism said that actually Jesus was the Father who had kind of morphed into a human being and who came to earth in a different mode of being. Another view originating from a priest named Arius stated Jesus was a created being. And there was a point in time where Jesus didn't actually exist. And so Arius said only the Father was really worthy of being called God. But over time it was decided that those views were egregiously inaccurate. And so people who believed in those uh, views were actually expelled from the church as heretics. No, no, no. Jesus clearly saw himself relating to the Father in this much, much deeper way. And so eventually the church came up with the right, the correct terminology, which is something that we all ought to believe. And they said, Jesus has existed from all eternity as God's only begotten Son. The Father doesn't create Jesus, rather they have always existed together in this Father-Son relationship. The Son and the Father share the same essence, they share the same nature, and they always, always have. So when we talk about Jesus knowing the Father, we're, we're articulating the fact that they share in this intimate bond of love from all eternity. It means so much more now when we say the Son is in the Father and the Father is in the Son. Okay, I know I opened with a lot of heavy theology and I was thinking twice about doing that but I thought I'd do it anyway. So maybe you're thinking, what on earth am I going on about? Why does this concern any of us? Well, that's exactly my point. Everything I just said really does concern us because Jesus goes on to say, as you read, that the deeply intimate connection to the Father that he has is something that's available to you and to me. Knowing God in this intimate way is the goal for all of us. And this knowing God goes far beyond some formal intellectual knowledge. If any of you out here are married, you'll know what I'm talking about, right? I know about my wife. I know that she has blonde hair. I know that she's scared of spiders. I know that she likes pancakes on a Sunday morning. But I also know my wife. I know what she's thinking even when we're miles apart. I can predict her moods fairly accurately often. 
And over time, even her desires in life become my desires. But here's the point. Even that level of intimacy that is achieved between a husband and a wife is just a fraction of the union we ought to have with God. We are called not to know about God, but to know God in that same relational way that Jesus does. God's own life becomes available to us. Good news, right? Right? Yes, thank you, right. Well, good news indeed, but not for everyone, Jesus says. Because Jesus says he chooses to reveal the Father to certain people. You know, the, the reality is some people will attain this intimacy with God, some people won't. Does this seem fair? Does Jesus just arbitrarily pick some people to reveal God to? And does he just arbitrarily pick some people to hide God from? Of course not. No, this is the point. Divine revelation comes to those who are open to it. Many of us are not. And so Jesus goes on to explain, all of us will choose one of two camps. The so-called wise and intelligent, who in their arrogance totally miss God's revelation, and then the little humble ones, the humble of heart, who gladly receive God. And so the wise and the intelligent are those that think they know better than God, people who rely on their own insights, and their own individual authority in order to find truth and meaning in their life. I know that I'm like that sometimes. But the little ones, by contrast, are not stupid, they're not unintelligent, but they know better than to rely on their own resources. They are open to letting God be a priority in their lives. They are the ones who are humble enough to cry out with Jesus like little children to a personal and loving father, saying, Abba, which means Daddy. Abba, I want your will for my life to take precedent over my own distorted and limited will. So presumably, we all want to have this intimate relationship with God, right? But how, how is this actually going to benefit us, you might be wondering? What does this do for you and for me? Well, this might sound pretty uh, over the top, but I believe it. We find the solution to all of our life's problems by being connected to Jesus. And Jesus, as you read here, he throws out this invitation to who? All. Jesus says, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Now, is Jesus saying something new? No, because God has always been a God of rest. In the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis, when God rests after six days of hard, creative, artistic work, what does he do? He takes a day off. God shows that he is not a workaholic, and he doesn't want us to be either. So he commands this Sabbath rest for us, a respite for our souls built into the weekly rhythm of our lives. And then the story of Exodus, all about finding rest from oppressive burdens. You remember the Pharaoh? For the Pharaoh, there is no such thing as rest from work. So he refuses to let God's people go into the desert just for three days so that they can worship. No weekends, no coffee breaks, no resting. 
And so what happens in Exodus? The Israelites cry out for rest. And God hears them. He sees the injustices and he sees the burdens being placed upon his people. And so he delivers them. He delivers them into a lush and beautiful promised land where they will have rest from their enemies. Our God was, is, and always will be a God of rest. And so in our passage, Jesus, being God, takes up this same theme of rest. And what is the rest that Jesus promises to his contemporaries? Well, for one thing, he's talking about the obsessive and unreasonable demands of the scribes and Pharisees, the demands that they place on people, excessively concerning themselves with regulating everyone's behavior. How burdensome to be told that you can't help your cow out of a ditch on the Sabbath day. How burdensome to be told that you have to wash your hands before every single snack. How burdensome to be told that you must wear certain clothes when you come to church. Or that you have to give a certain amount of money. Or that you have to believe all the right doctrines about everything. And I think Jesus is also talking about the burdens, the daily burdens that we all carry. The pressures of life that we all face the stress, the anxiety, the depression, the loneliness. We're all restless, aren't we? You may as well admit it. We all get so restless. And so, as we think about the final words of this passage, isn't the last thing we want another yoke to put around our necks? I have a slide to show you, if you guys have put it up. If you're like me, you probably used to think of a yoke in maybe this way. When I read the passage, I thought of a yoke in this very negative way, something that wears you down. I thought that Jesus was talking about this cattle yoke, a wooden beam attached to a pair of cows, forcing them to work together to carry a load. But that yoke, to me, looks so awkward, so painful. If you show the next slide, you'll see that the yoke Jesus is referring to is a human yoke worn by a person to simply distribute the weight across the shoulders. A yoke actually makes it easier to carry your burdens. So when Jesus talks about taking up his yoke, it is not something cumbersome or exhausting but something that makes carrying your load far easier. Note that Jesus never promises, never promises that following him means that you're going to be free from burdens. In fact, Jesus assures us that we will have difficult things to deal with in our lives. But under his yoke, we can handle whatever it is that life throws at us because now we have this intimate union with God. So maybe you're sitting here today and you believe that this rest is something that God has for you, but maybe you think it's something that you're going to have to wait so long for, something that will arrive one day in heaven in the far off future, and in the meantime, you just have to suck it up. But if that's what you think, you're wrong. Now, while those eschatological dimensions of eternal rest are true, Jesus tells us if we put on his yoke now, we can all experience rest today. When we make God the absolute priority in life, when we keep God at the forefront of our imagination, our heaviness is lifted immediately and our souls feel lighter and at peace. So my simple challenge for us all today is this. 
And guys, you know what your burdens are. Anxiety, maybe. Insecurity. Stress. Addiction. Guilt. Shame. Loneliness. Fear. And maybe, maybe you're scrambling around, trying to find the rest you need from these burdens, but you keep attaching yourself to the wrong things. Your ego, money, pleasure, maybe a workout routine, maybe your career, maybe another relationship. I urge you all, break free from the false yokes that are weighing you down. We can all feel so restless at times. It's so easy just to watch our whole lives fly by as we hopelessly, hopelessly put our rest in the wrong things. But ultimately, all of those finite things will fail and they will never satisfy you. Why? Simply because they are not God. Jesus says, come to me, all of you, Attach yourself instead to my easy yoke. Have your burdens, but keep them in their proper place. Instead, feel full and feel rested, even when times are tough, knowing that with me and in me and through me, you too can share in the divine life. Amen.